The KPMG Board Leadership Center presents Race and Accountability in the Boardroom. Please welcome KPMG's Vice Chair of Audit, Scott Flynn. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Scott Flynn, and I serve as KPMG's Vice Chair of Audit and lead KPMG's Board Leadership Center. Uh, wherever you're tuning in from, uh, we hope your families and employees and communities uh, are managing under these unprecedented circumstances and challenging times. As you all know, uh, there's a critical dialogue taking place today in companies, corporate boardrooms, and around the country about systemic racism and injustice. The tragic death of George Floyd and all of the painful events and, and social unrest this country has been going through, including right now in Louisville related to Breonna Taylor, have created a tremendous urgency around diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think the question we all face now is, how will it be different this time? At KPMG, uh, we've been doing a lot of listening and self-reflection, uh, like I'm sure many of your companies and boards have been doing over these past few months. But it's also clear that it's time to move from talk to action. Talking the talk is important, but walking the walk is now imperative. We have a great panel uh, to help us explore uh, what that means for companies, for boards, and for a corporate America that candidly everyone is looking to for leadership and action in this critical moment of our history. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, I hope you find this session helpful to moving your organization from conversations to concrete action and meaningful change. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our moderator Stephen Brown, uh, Senior Advisor with KPMG's Board Leadership Center uh, to, to introduce his esteemed panel. Stephen. Thank you, Scott, and welcome to our audience. And thank you for choosing KPMG's Board Leadership Center. There are certainly plenty of choices of places and people with whom you can spend your time and you chose to be here with us. And we have an extremely important board leadership program for you today. A little of what we're gonna try to accomplish today how and why, including introducing our distinguished panel. Our program is entitled, The Fire is Now, Race and Accountability in the Boardroom. 2020 has brought us all fire in every sense of the word, metaphorically from the ongoing pandemic, racial unrest and social justice questions, and literally to the very real and actual wildfires in the Western part of the United States. Indeed, our sympathies are with all who are dealing with these tragedies. Of course, our title is a nod to the 1963 essay, The Fire Next Time, by the great American poet and prophet of the civil rights movement, James Baldwin. In his essay, Baldwin evaluates the situation of blacks in America a century after the Emancipation Proclamation and makes an excoriating condemnation of the terrible legacy of racial injustice. He writes, and I paraphrase a little bit, many people indeed know better, but find it very difficult to act on what they know. To act in this context is to be committed, and to be committed requires a pivot from the status quo. Well, at the Board Leadership Center, one of the most helpful things we can do now is have a meaningful conversation continuing with our mission to bring insights into the boardroom. To wit, in the lead up to today's program, in order to have a meaningful conversation, over the last several weeks, we have spoken with a number of experts, lead directors and their fellow board members, diversity experts and investors. We've gathered an expert panel of multifaceted superstars with an abundance of wisdom to share with us. And as they enter the virtual room with us, noting that their bios are on our website, I will tell you a little bit about them. As a group, we have represented the best of the expertise of the Fortune 500, expertise in the fields of diversity and inclusion, investment banking, board and executive search, public and private corporate board service, investor relations, human capital management leadership, and then some. I'll first welcome, virtually welcome, Gwen Houston. Gwen is an accomplished, forward-thinking and results-driven global business consultant Ms. Houston is the former Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer of Microsoft, Campbell Soup, Aetna, and Nike. She's a board member of several 
talent and diversity inclusion related not for profits. I virtually welcome Gwen Houston to our panel. Thank She's joined you, Stephen. and glad you were here with us. Um, and you're joined by Victor Arias Jr. Victor is a veteran of board and director board director search that industry having practiced at Hydric and Struggles, RSL Partners, Spencer Stewart, and currently is managing director at Diversified Search and leads that firm's Dallas Fort Worth office. He's a trustee emeritus of Stanford University, Board of Trustees, and has served for over a decade on the board of NASDAQ listed Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen. I virtually welcome Victor Arias Jr. Thank you, Stephen. Glad you're here with us. And finally, but not least, please virtually welcome Dane Holmes. Dane is co-founder and CEO of Escalera, a company that enables other companies to transform their HR operations by improving employee engagement, productivity, and growth. He comes to Escalera after almost two decades at Goldman Sachs, where he was the former head of human capital management, served on that firm's <laughs> management and partnership committees. He also headed that firm's Investor Relations Division, where I met him. And after leading Goldman's Investment Banking Division, Financial Institutions Group. I welcome you, Dane, and all three of our panelists. Now, we'll get to spending the bulk of our time discussing a number of strategies and tactics and policies, which we've gathered from the various investors, board members, and experts we spoke, spoke to uh, in the last few weeks. We will then take questions from our audience using the chat function before we end. At first, what I'd like to do is, and I will skip, I should say, I'm going to skip the urge to ask each of you for a contextual literary analysis of James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. Uh, however, I did want to continue with that metaphorical theme and ask whether fire this time will be different. And, and we'll start with Gwen, our former chief diversity officer, and you probably started in that chief diversity officer line of work well before they had that title of CDO, chief diversity officer. You've seen a lot in your career. What might be different this time? And as you talk to us, uh, we have one, we have one and, and only one slide uh, for this program. Uh, we'll, we'll put up that slide for the audience. So Gwen, please take it away. What's different this time? Well, during this, uh, this resurgence, resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, I think it's, you know, we're still waiting to see how things unfold. But what may be different this time is the degree and depth of introspection across corporate America uh, relative to, to the lack of diversity. I mean, I think this movement has shed a, an urgent and necessary light on the fact that corporate America is losing its racial diversity. And I know you're going to put the slide up, but this, you know, the concerns are really relative to the lack of, of our declining presence of Black executives across corporate America. And, you know, even after a generation or more of well-educated and highly talented Black professionals have forged <laughs> a path through corporate America, several of them as CEOs, and now have retired, we have still failed to see any meaningful and sustainable progress. And uh, as the slide shows, I mean, in the 65 years since the, the Fortune 500 list has been in existence, only 18 Black executives have led uh, major corporations as CEOs or, or, or chairmen. Uh, only two of the 18 are Black women. And currently, we only have uh, four uh, all male black CEOs. Um, you know, by way of comparison, 10 years ago, we had seven. And so when you start to look at this, it, it, it really is quite, you know, quite concerning. Um, that's less, you know, it's about 1%. Um, but even if you look across a number of industries, you know, certainly the tech sector, um, some of the largest tech firms have no black executives in the C-suite. I mean, Amazon has made some recent promotions to change that, um, but even take the financial sector uh, where you have the three largest banks, um, you know, Chase, uh, Bank of America and Wells Fargo with no blacks in the C-suite. And recently the CEO of Wells Fargo made a statement this summer in support of Black Lives Matter and when meeting with employees, 
he said, you know, one of the reasons why we, we are not able to achieve our diversity goals is due to a, a, a sort of limited talent pool for hiring uh, black professionals. Well, that didn't kind of go over very well because certainly uh, the issue of limited talent pools for, for ethnic minorities and specifically black professionals has been used as an excuse uh, in terms of, of trying to meet goals. But the research shows that it's, it's less about the pipeline and it's more about preferences. You know, preferences versus requirements for the jobs. And we also know that when people go to, to fill these very elite executive roles, that, that they tend to tap into rather insular personal, professional, social networks. And people go with who they know. They go with who they can relate to and who they feel comfortable with. And as a result, a number of you know, black men, men and women are absent from leadership roles. And why this matters this time is that in this era of what I call um, CEO activism, employees are saying to their companies, hey, it's one thing to make a proclamation in support of Black Lives Matter, but it's an entirely different thing to look inward and do the hard work of assessing the corporate culture to understand, are you recruiting, hiring, promoting, compensating, bonusing, you know, uh, supporting uh, black talent equal to white talent? And I think that, that is what is different. There's a groundswell of conversation about that this time. Thank you, Gwen. And, and I'll turn to Victor next. Uh, you've been in the board search space for a, a quite some time. The current firm that you're with, Diversified Search, has a derivative of diversity in its name. And as you've shared with me that uh, in the last few months, you've seen an incredible uptick in inquiries uh, to you and your firm on board search. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, is this time different? Well, no, it clearly is different. Uh, going back to some of the comments that, uh, that Gwen made, look, I mean, uh, today we have instant coverage of what's going on compared to the 60s. We have a heightened awareness of color, even though the backdrop is still black versus white. Um, I think, you know, the communities are highly polarized than they were, were ever before. But you sprinkle in, you know, a lot more uh, color, whether it's Latinos or Asians to that whole mix. And there's a lot of fear out there. And, um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of fear mongering that goes along with that. And, um, you know, I heard, I heard a very interesting uh, data point this morning at a, at a, a conference called Latitude. This uh, researcher from Cal Lutheran said, look, the, three, the top three wealthiest men are wealthier together than the bottom 50% in this country. That's an incredible, incredible data uh, data point. Um, the disparity of, of wealth in this country is awful. And I think that just leads to a lot more of, uh, you know, these, these feelings that we're feeling today versus uh, back in the 60s. But going back to your point, um, if I look at, uh, in a recent report by ISS that came out in the New York Times, uh, you know, the progress in the boardroom has been awful. Um, if you look at um, the, the Russell 3000, um, there are only 4% black directors, 2% Hispanic directors compared to the, the, the population uh, that we uh, represent in this country. And so in my mind, uh, it's, it's different from the 60s, but it isn't different because there hasn't been, there's been very little, little uh, progress at all. Yeah, uh, Dane. Uh, you've seen this issue of diversity and inclusion from several different aspects across the corporate ecosystem. You know, as, a, as an investment banker, as a head of IR, as a head of human capital, by the way, as a head of IR, you were listening to the institutional investors and other investors on behalf of the board. And as I'm always reminded, uh, it is the board, the only people imbued with the power to judge a director with a vote. And so you've, you've heard it all from them as chief IR, as chief human capital management. You heard from all those parts. And now you're CEO of Escalera, which I believe, and you're going to correct me if I'm wrong, it's a firm that uh, as a startup in Silicon Valley, you've made two bets. Uh, the bet that the fire this time is different. And secondly, that to deal with this fire, you must have the 
right data in hand. I think I might got that right, but I'll leave it to you to tell me about whether the fire is going to still burn and how to deal with it. So uh, first and foremost, Stephen, as usual, I'm stuck saying you're right. Uh, those are the two bets, and as usual, I have to acknowledge it and agree with you on that. Uh, on this real question of what's different this time, I guess I'd say a couple of things. One, societal, and then how that translates uh, to corporate America. I mean, I strongly believe that corporate America is not isolated from society. It's not that the issues stop at the corporate lobby door. Uh, they, they come into the corporation and exist there as well. But just first on you know what's different this time, I do think there's a couple factors that are fundamentally different. One, we tend to look at these, uh, these situations as events as opposed to progressions or evolutions. And I will tell you, we're in the process of a cultural evolution. And so people might want to um, you know, coordinate it with George Floyd or other incidents, but let's face it, this has been an evolutionary process that's been building over time. And I think you have to get out of the mindset that this is an event because that gets you in kind of the compliance or what I would call the you know, crisis management mode as opposed to uh, the mode of long-term planning, which is this is a progression, this is an evolution and I need, to, I need to get on top of it. The second thing that I think is different about it and my conversations with a lot of corporate directors and CEOs uh, about this is you have to realize that essentially the entire population has their own TV station and newspaper in their pocket. Um, they have it. And that is fundamentally different now than before. And as a result, uh, you are going to sadly continue to have these issues. Um, you're going to continue to have them. They're going to continue to be publicized. And if people were, were video or printing on them a little bit before, they will be doing that even more so now. Um, and so I think that you have to, you know, you have to accept that as a factor. The thing that I think is interesting about this, uh, though, than before, is that, frankly, the whole world is behind. Everyone. The vast majority of CEOs who uh, have trust with me say to me, I feel wholly ill-equipped to address this issue. Now, there's a good news and a bad news part of that. The good news uh, about that is you have great opportunity uh, to be a leader in it because nobody has a giant advantage. The negative part uh, about it, or thing that's hard, is that also means everybody's going to be fighting down the same path at the same time, whether that's for talent, whether that's for strategies, whether that's for a voice within the community or relationships. Everybody's going after those same things. So it has to be authentic and real and sustained, I think, for you to be effective this time versus, uh, versus in the past. And so I think it's very much uh, different. The last thing I'll say about what makes it different and what people should realize is the next generation is having a different experience than the prior one. And so their willingness to step into that corporate lo uh, lobby and accept a different outcome to the one that they experienced at school, uh, the one that they were taught and raised to believe in, is, is increasingly dwindling. So this is not a question of if it's going to happen. It's just a question of when. Yeah. Well, Dana, I'm going to stay with you. And I, uh, I want you to put on your chief of IR hat uh, of an extraordinary large uh, company uh, because you've had these conversations around a number of issues in governance, particularly under the social issue of diversity and inclusion with investors. And uh, like I said, we've talked to a number of uh, investors um, and they have said publicly, and they also told me privately, they, they're laser focused on this issue. Uh, some of them, and I've heard a variety of different uh, 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 tactics, uh, which we're gonna start getting to tactics in a moment, but I just wanted you to uh, it will be helpful for our audience because you've been in these conversations uh, to respond to the following. Uh, they want uh, an articulation of what role diversity plays in the firm's strategy, uh, how the board governs that strategy and has oversight over it, what goals do you have on diversity. They want voluntary disclosure on corporate diversity and on diversity inside of the board. Um, and they want an assessment of any barriers to entry for recruitment of diverse talent inside the company. I can go on. They, 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 there's one firm that has already spotted uh, a number of com companies based on those companies articulating that human capital management, their employees are material and crucial to the, their success. So they wrote to those companies and are going to engage with those companies 
uh, based on that statement to see how well they're doing. If you could, if, so putting on that hat of IR, you know, going way, way back to your young years, um, talk about what you've just heard in terms of what these demands are from investors. Yeah, so uh, thanks for that, Stephen. Two comments that I'd make first. I think everybody needs to be aware that there's been two, once again, evolutions or progressions that have taken place in the investor world that people have to wrap their arms around. First of all, in every investor organization of any significant size, there is a deep group of people who've been committed to social responsibility for a long time, and they are experts. So they have, they have their moment, they have the infrastructure, they have the knowledge, and they exist. So it's not one of those cases where you're going to have an inexperienced or I don't know how to think about this um, person having these initial conversations. You will have people who've been at this work for 10 or 20 years. And so uh, expect that first meeting. That I think the technical term is to be hot <laughs> um, as a result because they have their moment. Um, second, uh, I would also say don't uh, lose sight of the fact that, you know, one of the largest growing asset classes among investors has been, you know, ESG related funds. And so there's also economics uh, behind this decision, which I think is, uh, is maybe different in the past. But as far as the path that I would say to anybody to think about them going down, uh, and while I'm hesitant to ever speak in generalizations, I think there's a general progression that most investors will take. The first step they'll say is give me data. Their data by their, their natural instinct, they'll show, you, show me the data. And I think everybody should expect those data requests to be double clicked, i.e. I gave you this, and then there's gonna be a set of questions of supporting data that I want uh, in addition to whatever I got. So that'll be one. Their next progression will be strategy. Okay, you've given me some data, wherever, whatever that data has led me to think about you, what is your strategy to improve the situation? And how, how should I think about that? Once they have data and strategy, they're gonna move very quickly to risk. So how do I think about the risk profile of your company as a byproduct of the data I've looked at and the strategy that you've said? And they will think about risk in a very broad way, reputationally, practically uh, as well. Then they're probably going to go through a period of what I would say experience and engaging with management. And ultimately, it's going to evolve to two other things, which is a culture discussion. Because at the root of all this is culture. And so you have, I have the data, you have the strategy, I understand the risks. Is your culture making you risky, more risky or less risky? And how do I want to feel about that from a cultural perspective? And then once they feel good about that um, dynamic, then they will quickly move to a bid and opportunity. Um, and it will quickly become a differentiator and it will become, I want to invest in company A versus company B because I actually think that they have the data, they understand, uh, they have a good strategy, they understand the risk, they're creating the right culture and they're going to be able to capitalize on this, on this moment. And I think that'll be the path. Some uh, investors will move that path, uh, down that path very quickly. Some will be slower, but that's ultimately, uh, I think, the progression they're going to work through. And I, I can appreciate that because uh, we've been in the room. We've both been in the same room on separate sides of the table uh, talking about these issues and they're real. And we, we found in speaking with directors, sometimes you just don't get the flavor about how committed uh, investors are. So um, I have one more question before we get to this, talking about these policies and tactics. I'm just going to go to Victor and ask you to put on your board member hat. Uh, and suppose you're a board member and you, you've listened to, to Dane now, um, who, who's talked to you about uh, what investors want and how they're thinking about it. And you go to your next quarterly board meeting and you talk about diversity through your, with your board members and management. And then uh, in unison, if management gets up and says, well, we are very, uh, this is sincere. Um, we, we care about it. Uh, but frankly, we've tried, but the pipeline of, develop, of diverse talent is just too limited for us. What would you say at that moment? Well, I, I think I need to sort of revert back to what Dane mentioned in his process. You know, what it's about data again. And so I think it's really educating my colleagues and the board that, uh, you know, there are opportunities to find talent and to get a, a better uh, sense for a different thought. And, and actually, we have to tie everything to the business imperative as a company, as directors. So we have to think about this as to, for example, what are our consumers demanding? And I'm, I'm going back to my days with Popeyes as well. I mean, who is driving the growth of our business? And then how responsible are we to shareholders? 
And so once we define that, then it, it's going to be very obvious that we need to figure out how to get more thinking around and insights around the different communities in our country that are going to drive that growth. The black communities, the brown communities. And so uh, I think once we kind of go through that, that whole process that dangers built out, and we've assessed the risk and we have to talk about the culture and figure out the culture, those opportunities will become very, very clear. And um, uh, I've had experiences on the other side, not wearing my board board hat in uh, wearing my recruiter hat, that uh, we have to spend time with our clients to think about those things that will change the way that they, they, they look at talent. And um, it's not gonna be just the typical CEO, CFO, you know, sort of funnel, it's got to be other things that add value to, to their business. So um, I, I, I do think that um, there's a knee jerk reaction right now by many companies to everything that's going on by saying, geez, let's go find some more you know, black or brown talent. Um, but they forget about the culture piece. How do we how do we make this sustainable? Uh, let's throw money at it. Let's go use our philanthropic dollars to invest in the communities that uh, that we need to invest in, but really, you know, not not have a sense of real empathy and and uh, and being genuine about it. So I think there's that knee jerk reaction. I think we're going to figure out what's going to happen uh, going forward here. Who's going to make the right call today and uh, that call in five years? Sure. Uh, I appreciate that. And so let's focus as a panel, um, sort of one of these lightning rounds, but not too lightning. And I'm going to start <laughs> with Gwen. I have a number, like I said uh, in the beginning, uh, speaking with a, several different experts have compiled a list, a pretty broad list. We're not going to get to everyone, but we'll spend some time talking about some tactics, strategies, and policies. Uh, we also have another number of questions, which I'm acknowledging that we have, and we will have time for, for, for most of those. Uh, if I don't get them in uh, through some of the questions that I have. But let's talk about the recruitment process. So I'll start with Gwen. Um, and I'm thinking about thinking about policies on a scale of tactics on a scale of uh, not effective at all to my, could be possibly effective to very effective, given all your skill sets and your experience. Uh, so you go ahead and put a label on it. Uh, and first up from a recruitment process, corporate diversity and boardroom diversity, the concept of the Rooney rule, or in Silicon Valley, I, I think they, they, they don't use the Rooney rule, they, they talk about diverse slates. Uh, and that's the concept of every time you do a senior hire or a board position, if you're doing a board, that the slate must contain uh, diversity in that slate before you go forward. Uh, not that you'll make a decision on that, but it must include that. That's called the Rooney Rule after an NFL owner out of Pittsburgh. Um, and uh, diversity slates is also a name for it. Gwen, your thoughts on that? Well, you know, my immediate qualifier is that it kind of all depends on a lot of things. But um, I do believe that and have used diverse slates, um, you know, operating under the Rooney Rule at times with different companies as well, um, is an important approach to making sure that you know, the recruiting team is pushed to go beyond you know, the usual suspects when it comes to gathering talent. A lot of times companies fall into this, this trap of creating what we call a success profile around certain you know, candidates or you know, where do we wanna to go to get the right candidate? And the right candidate tends to look you know, like the person who's been in the role for some time. And it precludes them from thinking more broadly about the rich array of, of diverse talent that's out there. Um, so I think diverse slates can be um, can be very beneficial. I think you have to put a lot of rules in place to manage how it's done and at certain levels. But but yeah, reasonably successful. Dane, your thoughts on diverse uh, slates yeah, or Rooney Rule? I agree with. So I would have put it in the middle camp. I agree with the point that the positive to me is it forces the recruiters to you know spread out and build connectivity to those talent pools. I would say though, uh, the negative of it is it doesn't mean it translates to hires. Um, and I've seen plenty of <laughs> plenty of cases where uh, the way the Rooney rule gets affected is, hey, we have five people, we're already well down the line of interviewing them. We kind of know the two we really want, but hey, there's no diversity, let's throw some diverse candidates on there. And I can guarantee you that process in particular won't result in a, in a diverse hire. 
Um, and so one version that I would, that I've thrown out to people as a way to think about it is we're going to have a diverse slate, but we're going to interview first and process first the diverse candidate. And if we find a diverse candidate that meets our criteria that we've established, we're going to move uh, forward on that uh, aggressively. Um, because there's always the capability to say, I know this person better, I trust this person more, you pick the answer and end up not with a diverse uh, hire. Victor, any comments? Yeah, look, I've been down this path many times um, as well. I totally agree with Gwen and, and Dane. Look, the Rooney rules only gets you to the process piece of it, but the selection process is where it is, you know, where the proof is in the pudding. And it depends on who's making that call, who's who's pulling the trigger. If I look at on the board process, most of the, you know, the, the, the folks that really make that impact are either the chairs of the NOMGOV committee, the board chair or the CEO. Nine out of those 10 people are white. They're not people of color. And so making that, you know, making that selection will take a lot of intentionality and courage. And sometimes it's easier to kind of go down the other path. And so I, I think that the Rooney rule by itself doesn't get you that. It helps. But I, I do think it's uh, you got to really push hard on, again, why are we doing this? And what would the impact be if we got some diverse talent? Oh, let me stick with you, Victor. And here's the next one up. Um, hiring, if you're hiring a, an outside third-party search consultant, that 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 diver, that search consultant be a diverse recruiter. Your thoughts on that? Look, I think uh, first of all, let's. Uh, if I look at board searches or even executive searches, I mean, um, on the board side, maybe a third of the outside board seats get done by by executive search firms. The rest get done the old-fashioned way. So you're sort of fighting all that whole. Uh, you know, cultural issue uh, right off the bat. But but on the executive search side, um, I think there is a real need to make sure that there are uh, diverse individuals as well that are part of that process that are consultants that can reflect and push and and, and uh, at least give our, our clients that uh, advice on what to do in, in these situations. Uh, that has not been the case, I don't think. In addition, I think um, these search firms need to have very intimate and genuine relationships with the communities of color. And, uh, and so that the executives uh, don't feel like, oh, geez, they're calling me because they need a black person or they need a brown person. Well, um, if you don't have those intimate relationships already established, it's just an uphill climb. So I think that Clients need to ensure that the consultants that come to the table have access and intimacy with those with those other communities of color. To my two other panelists, does the uh, does the search consultant matter in the makeup of that consultancy? I would say it, it can matter for certain, um, especially if the company has not had a good track record bringing in diverse talent. Uh, um, the, the, it's likely that there's a reputation on the street that X company, uh, you know, might call you up, but they don't often make the decision to hire diverse talent. So the word gets out there. So I think sometimes you have to do, um, you know, something quite different and look at uh, alternative uh, sources of, of sourcing. And sometimes I just want to shake things up. I don't want the same search firms, you know, getting all the business you know, for some of the companies I work for, that's a lot of, luc that's lucrative business. And so I want to be able to have a diversity of search firms uh, to see how well they all do at bringing us great talent and creating um, opportunities for us to, to hire some of the best and brightest folks out there with a complement of diversity at the end of it. So it, it does matter. Uh, sure, Jane. Maybe one comment I would make quickly on this too is, I think it's important, um, obviously, to use diverse recruiters, and there, there, there's a practical aspect that also often they have connectivity uh, to that community. But I think that's just step one. If you're really trying to drive change and you're part of an ecosystem, you should not let the other majority members off the hook. Um, if they are doing the majority of the placement, the only way that you're gonna actually get a balanced system is start saying to a, a group that maybe doesn't do any diverse hiring, Hey, until you start bringing me diverse candidates, you're cut off 
And that's a requirement, not, hey, I'm going to find a firm that only does diverse searches and that's how I'm going to solve my diversity issue, doesn't change the broader system and doesn't um, ultimately create the depth and breadth of the change that you want to create. So I think that the, the pressure has to be shared. There's a long tradition on these issues of, of uh, grabbing a diverse person and also saying, you solve it, you're the diverse person. Uh, my experience is that uh, one person cannot move 100. Um, and so I think you got to uh, solicit the help and aid of the other 99 if you actually expect to have sustainable uh, change. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. And uh, so I'm just gonna pick one more in the category of recruitment process. And this is an interesting one uh, used by, uh, definitely used by many universities. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, in addition to someone's resume being submitted that you also required a separate diversity and inclusion statement from the candidate. So you have the resume, then you have a separate statement from that candidate on how he or she thinks about diversity and inclusion with the idea that if diversity and inclusion and human capital management are meaningful if you're hiring a manager, then write a statement about it and we're gonna look at that and preview that uh, uh, before going on to the next step. Anyone can take it. Uh, I'll say a word about it. I'm, sure. I've, not, I've not had experience using a statement in addition to the resume, but rather it is baked into the, uh, the process of, of sourcing candidates, especially for executive level roles, maybe you know senior director or senior director and above roles. It is part of the the as you know sort of the the assessment process that looking uh, at leadership skills and leadership um, experiences and points of view, we want to get a full array of both you know their technical capability as well as sort of their you know their sort of mindset relative to experiences like diversity and equity inclusion. We want to understand how that, what they think of it, and also how that helps define their leadership style. Because we're hoping to, tr to transform the culture with future leaders. And you've got to sort of bake this into uh, the, mind, the mindset of the, the perspective of future leaders so that they see how important it is coming into the company. So that's the way I've used it in the past. past and I, I find it very, very important and very enlightening as part of the uh, you know, the recruitment process. Um, a, sure, Victor. No, Glenn, I, I, I totally agree with you. I, I would prefer it not to be part of the resume process because resumes can be all kinds of things in there that you have to go uh, search for anyway. But I think it has to be very intentional part of the, of the interviewing process of the assessment and, and be very straightforward. It, it, it's not really in my uh, experience, it's not the answer that people provide to a question like that, it's how they answer it. Yes. And because if they're uneasy with it, then you, you can sense that. But if it's really, uh, you know, if it's here, then you, you're gonna find that out too. And I think that's really important. In the category of uh, corporate policies and goals, uh, and we, again, uh, I mentioned this when I talk about what investors want, uh, there's a big push on disclosure of diversity data, metrics, and processes. Thoughts on that? We'll go with you, Dane. Uh, it will be no shock. I think a huge part of it is data. And I will tell you, um, you know, data is, is an evolutionary process as well. We will start with representation data, but um, I strongly believe representation data does not translate to an inclusive culture. Um, and there's no doubt that there are plenty of organizations that are out there that actually can present very good representation statistics but I would say actually not only don't have an inclusion, uh, inclusive culture, have an anti-inclusion culture. Um, and you can think about frontline versus, uh, versus uh, corporate office and all kinds of combinations of, of, of those scenarios that are there. So I do believe that it's ultimately in data. Um, it is you know, obviously in part why we created Escalera and created our inclusion index. But what you're ultimately trying to measure, I think is uh, your culture and your level of culture, uh, inclusion within your culture, and things like representation should be outputs uh, uh, to, to that uh, culture. Um, and, you know, just for a second to tie this back to uh, the other side of, you know, the question you had before about, hey, do you like these individual statements? 
I would be wary of anything that has the propensity to be a check the box exercise, which often data um, in use and I like just report this becomes a check the box. Oh, they reported it. This is how it is. It's fine. Um, what I would say is um, what really matters is more patterns of behavior. And that's where data is the most valuable. What is the success rate? What do promotion acceleration look like at your company? Um, you know, how do you think about uh, the role of inclusive teams relative to productivity and meeting your corporate objectives? So there's that kind of data, which is the data that is used every day in so many other ways around, you know, ability to connect with your consumer, ability to have a effective supply chain, all the techniques exist out there. They just now need to be applied to people. Thank you. Here's another one. And it's part of one of the questions we have, and it's down on our list. Uh, and we'll start with Victor. And that's the concept of these voluntary diverse databases. Uh, and this includes one question we had. Uh, there's a, a women's group out there that uh, has a list of qualified women who are great candidates for board positions. And uh, the, the writer talks about that it has helped uh, headhunters and non-gov communities. Could we do the same with uh, candidates of color? Uh, and I know of at least 10, maybe 15, and in the last month, a couple of new organizations or associations that popped up and said, hey, we're going to do this diverse database and we're going to make it free, public. They're not headhunters, uh, so that non-gov committees can use it. You know, your thoughts on this concept of of the voluntary uh, da database. Look, I think it's I think it is helpful. In, in uh, uh, on the opposite side of not having any data and not having any information, it, it's absolutely helpful. And I think you know the important part of these groups is to curate those people that are on those lists. Uh, the last thing you want to have is a group that will send you here's twenty names and maybe only two are really qualified that, that just you know, it, it depends on on how you curate those those and, and uh, so I think you know I know there's, there are clearly lots of women groups uh, whether you know catalyst and women corporate directors you know there's uh, Latino corporate directors there's the there's ELC executive leadership council of black directors there's ascend but I think many of those organizations just do a good job of curating or even having this these board ready programs to ensure that those folks understand a little bit about governance. And so on the flip side, by providing those names to those individuals or putting them on those on those lists, it might give those individuals a false sense that they're ready to take on a board and they're gonna sit there and say, where am I now? Where's my call? I'm not getting any boards. So, <laughs> so. How, how about um, anti-bias training? And we should note that there are all different types of training around this. Uh, and certainly we have got a question around, do, do people, uh, consultants come in and train NAMI Gov committees of the board? So in general, the general topic of training, and we'll start with you, Gwen, and maybe you'll have uh, go a little bit deeper to talk about different types of training uh, and what's most effective. And the what are the problems? And what are the problems with training? Okay. Well, the, the anti-bias or unconscious bias uh, training is kind of de minimis. It, it's sort of a baseline. Uh, for companies, and, and, and I'll say, I, I know for the companies I've worked for, we were doing anti-bias training 20 years ago, uh, and it certainly has evolved to some extent, uh, but at the same time, I think it's, it's a, 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 a basic level uh, course to kind of educate people on the fact that, um, that bias is often at times con unconscious, but I also believe at times it is conscious. And so being able to understand and distinguish that is an important part of creating a level of emotional intelligence for all employees, especially those at management. Um, but I think beyond uh, the anti-bias and unconscious bias training, because we've done a lot of it and it, it really didn't change our culture that much. What we honestly had to do was really understand, get at root cause assessment, what was happening in our culture that, uh, that kept us from being more inclusive uh, that kept us from being more equitable because you can have diversity. You, you can hire diverse people. You can show all the data that, that, that exists uh, around representation, but it doesn't necessarily mean that your culture is inclusive. And it certainly doesn't even mean that with diversity and inclusion, you're doing things equitably for groups that have been marginalized and don't start out in the same place as others. 
So I think the, the, the root is to kind of engage in these, what the people are calling them constructive conversations, crucial conversations, where there are dialogues across dimensions of diversity, where people get to actually have the, the, the hard conversation, the difficult conversation around why you experience this and I don't see it and why I see this and you don't understand it. Uh, being able to do that in a meaningful way uh, with very experienced uh, team of facilitators or consultants uh, who, who, who really take the time to work with you to understand what's happening in your culture, how you would assess your culture, uh, what are the strengths of your culture, but also what are the weaknesses and opportunities and design a program that's really catered to you know, driving organizational change and transformation culturally is where companies need to go. And I will tell you some of the most effective training I've ever done has been around uh, what we call dialogues across differences are crucial conversations with very, very uh, talented and, and well-trained facilitators. Uh, we were even able to do these virtually across uh, the globe. And so um, that was one that I thought was much, much more effective than just the anti-bias stuff. Have you, uh, are there any cautionary tales that you have about training uh, that that could uh, uh, not go as well as you had planned or well as people would plan who were putting them in? Yeah, you never know. I mean, this is why the facilitators have to be so well-trained because they're saboteurs among every session. Uh, and sometimes very innocently, things just go off the rails. Um, we have people who come out uh, as members of the LGBTQ community for the first time in these rooms. Uh, we've had things absolutely explode in these rooms uh, where people get very divisive. It gets very personal. Uh, it's an emotional topic. It's a personally emotional and provocative topic. So you have to have facilitators who can really keep everybody grounded, manage the, the conversation, share the information. And especially, you know, people want to talk about their lived experiences in these trainings because that's kind of the story, the art of the storytelling and where people start to understand each other's very different perspectives and very different uh, life experiences. But it can go off the rails very, very easily and you have to be so careful. Um, there are also a lot of uh, articles I read about why diversity training doesn't work. And I, I, I hate seeing that because it's, it's really less training. It's about leadership development. You know, learning to be more diverse, equitable, and inclusion is a part of, of leadership, and, and all employees can gain from it. So, but it, it has to be well thought out, and you really do have to understand your culture and the environment in which you're doing this, because um, that can make the difference in whether or not it's effective. And again, over time, like Dane keeps saying, things are evolutionary. You know, where you started out three years ago on this training hopefully has evolved into a different place of maturity and EQ, IQ, you know, that type of thing. Victor, how about uh, making sure that diversity and inclusion is part of the executive compensation package for those most senior executives? Look, I've been, um, I had the privilege of serving on an advisory uh, board for Pepsi both uh, black and Latino. And the CEO at that time, uh, Steve Reinemann, uh, implemented uh, a, a uh, incentive compensation at the executive level to move diversity along a few lines. One, acquiring talent, but, uh, but then really more importantly, mentoring. And they weighted the uh, year-end bonuses based on that. And it made a great difference at the senior levels and it made a great difference at the entry level, but where it came off the rails was in the middle. Middle management fought it. They, you know, they they made just they just didn't make sustainable long term, um, uh, you know, decisions. And um, but I think that's where it has to start. So it has to start uh, start at the top. Um, and just getting it effectively done in, in middle management is really the key. And I don't have an answer for that. Maybe Dane and, and Gwen might, but uh, it, it, that's where I've seen it. Yeah. Dane, he's put you on a spot. That wasn't me. <laughs> he was, you know, uh, I used to be friends. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, 
I'll say two things. I really, I really agree with the idea of it being an incentive at the top. Um, that being said, I think it has to be weighted relative to its prioritization. So I think, you know, people will say these things like, this is one of my top four um, strategic imperatives for the company, but we're going to weight your diversity bonus by 10% up or down. Those two things don't exist together. Um, so if it's going to be a priority, it's got to be a majority and every board knows that, you know, a CEO can have a list of strategic objectives. That's like 10 things long. Um, so where is it in there and, and, and is it appropriately weighted? I will say for middle management, which is where I think a lot of very well-intended, capable, invested companies fail, I think you have to have a very different incentive model. I think that incentive model has to be about um, consequences and punishment. And what do I mean by that? I mean, you cannot be a manager if you don't X. If you like, it, it's actually gates. Because if you actually allow something as morphous as this, and as many layers as away from the CEO as usually exists, there's a million semi-credible reasons for it not to happen. <laughs> and so, uh, so in order for it to happen, it has to be more of a consequence of to enter into this position of power and influence. You have to have a track record of having, uh, uh, you know, created this before, just like you would think about in a sales leadership. Nobody promotes a sales leader until they have a track record of building sales teams and creating sales. Nobody gets to run a plant unless they have a track record of first running the line. I think uh, similarly, it's got to be co consequences, meaning the lack of the ability to elevate unless you show a track record of being able to do it. And Dan, I have one more question. We're going to get to Q&A, so I encourage our participants to use that chat box. If you have a Q&A, there's, there's plenty already in that queue that I will get to in about five minutes. But I want to ask you for your elevator pitch of, of, of your firm has created something called the Inclusion Index. Yeah. Why should I have that at my company? Yeah, I'll just tell you about it quickly. It touches on a whole bunch of things that both Gwen and, and Victor uh, talked about. One, we uh, first let me just say there is no silver bullets on this. Whenever you say the word cultural, another way to uh, recharacterize that is it's systematic. Because if you have a cultural, culture seeps through everything. So if you are trying to adjust culture, you're trying to address the system. And so where we're really focused on at Escalera is really two things, accountability and sustainability. Um, a couple of things about training. We only actually believe in strength-based training. We do not believe, you know, shame and blame. And that's often where these conversations, these courageous conversations can go off is that it's, you know, someone making someone else feel defensive or someone else being defensive about the conversation. In our inclusion index, we have four factors that we view as the four pillars of inclusion. Trust, belonging, voice, and growth mindset. Those are traits that any high performance organization should want. They are also the pillars of driving an inclusive culture. And they speak to everyone. There is no one in an organization that doesn't want to have a high level of trust, doesn't want to have a high level of belonging, doesn't want to feel like their voice can be heard. And if you want them to be successful, they better have a growth mindset. And so through that process, and we use micro learnings in that 10 minute or less um, uh, learnings done over time, what you ultimately can get to, which is what really, really is the hidden benefit of this dialogue, is the opportunity, the high performance opportunity that comes from creating an inclusive environment. It benefits everybody. It goes immediately from this concept of it's a zero sum game where in order for a group to get something, they have to take it from someone else to a, to a dynamic of one plus one equals three. Um, and that's where inclusion is supposed to be, where everybody feels like they can voice, everybody feels like they can arrive and you can get to the best answer. Um, and you can only do that with data and measurement and you can definitely only do that with training. I appreciate that. Before we get to questions, I wanna ask Gwen, um, there's also a concept of having employee referral bonuses and you see that throughout the organization. I've used it by the way, uh, thankfully very nicely. Uh, but specific employee bonuses for, for referring diverse talent. Your thoughts on that? Well, it's a concept like many of these that starts out with the notion of great intent, but it's all about the execution. And that's where things can get a little, a little muddy here. I mean, I think employee referral bonuses have been successfully implemented across a lot of companies for years. It's when we decide that we're going to have an extra 
bonus for certain types of talent. And I have seen this issue of paying employees. Let's say that the you know it's a five hundred dollar referral fee for any employee, but then if you get a black employee, black or brown person, and they get hired, it's a thousand dollars. Well, that starts to change um, the energy, the attitude, and the perspective because many people related it to well, there's a bounty on black and brown heads uh, for you to go get, and it creates a perception that that's the only value that these talented candidates may bring to the table. And that's exactly the wrong perception that we want to create around diversity. There's already enough of a, a, a I think an inaccurate perception around the fact that, that you know, black and brown people create a sense of risk when hiring, that maybe they don't have the intellectual pro, you know, uh, prowess to go after some of these bigger roles. And so the last thing we want to do is create a sense that, well, it, it cost us more to go get them because they're so rare, there's a limited talent pool, and that's just, uh, you know, it's, let's go do diversity today through recruiting. So I think you have to be extremely careful about sending the wrong message uh, around this. And also for black and brown talent coming in, you know, they don't want to be made to feel that this is the only reason why they were valued, uh, that it's because of these, these, these darn diversity goals uh, that they got in. And it's not about, uh, you know, their immense um, potential and, and the current skills that they bring to the table. So I, I'm against it. I'm against it. So, now with, with all of these, and there's so many more, um, uh, it's the way you do it and the way you execute it. By the way, that's, that's the answer to any corporate initiative, whether it's supply chain or uh, a merger, it's, it's how you do it and how you integrate it. Um, and for so here's some questions from the audience uh, and anyone can take these uh, and we'll go for the next 10 mm -hmm. minutes with this um how will these efforts not result in the appearance of tokenism i think victor should take this one on <laughs> there you go give it right back to him give it right back. so victor oh. any of these efforts uh not result in the appearance of tokenism <laughs> But you know what? Let, let, let's, let me frame that up a little bit more. Uh, let's talk about at the in the boardroom, in the boardroom, uh, going out and hiring a diverse candidate in the boardroom. Well, I think it goes back to what we were just talking about, and that is uh, the intentionality. You know, the respect. Uh, what is the intent? Um, and if the intent isn't there, and the and being genuine about it and respectful, it ain't going to go anywhere. And so I think. Um, um, uh, there's that slippery slope of feeling that it's tokenism. And that's why I said before, if, if you don't have responsible, genuine relationships in these communities, uh, it, it's just not gonna work. When I was um, at my prior firm at Corn Ferry, we, we socialized DNI around three things. It's people, product, and purpose. So people, you have to know how, you know, who's who's hiring who and, and, and how are we hiring them? Number two is what are we, you know, what, what is the product that we're selling and who's delivering it and who's trying to sell it? And three is purpose. Do we have appropriate relationships in the community so that we have this, this ecosystem of, of, of a true sense of uh, commitment to diversity and inclusion? So I can understand the question. I, it just depends on, on the intent. Sure. Yeah, I would uh, just- Thank you, Dane. Go ahead. <laughs> Gwen, please. Oh, I, I, just to add to what, to what Victor said is just, it, it, it seems that fundamentally there has to be a deeper business value and, under, and appreciation for what diversity, equity, and inclusion bring to a business. It's not just about you know social do-goodism. It's about capturing new markets. It's about understanding customers. It's about the ability to problem solve, create greater innovation for markets that are increasingly more diverse. And I know personally the difference it can make when you present the data that show who our you know, external customer demographic is and how that's changed and evolved across uh, the years. I've worked for companies that had no idea they were designing product, what they thought was still you know, like the captive audience of a, um, a straight white American male who was upper class. And they found when we went back with our strategy and finance teams to do an analysis of our external customer demographics, we found that the, the you know, the communities and the customers who were over indexing on our products were essentially Latinos and Blacks. And it, and it shocked 
the executive leadership team because they had no idea. Mm -hmm. They had just been sailing along for years thinking that it was the same customer all along and that's who they were designing for. And ultimately they started to lose market share and they were trying to figure out why. And this was the answer. So I think being able to, as Dayton said, it's a lot about data. It's a lot about understanding. And not all data matters the same. Great quote by Einstein, you know, not everything that can be measured matters. And just because it can be measured doesn't mean it matters. So you really have to crystallize your thinking about data and what, what really matters and how it will really impact your business outcomes. And then that the leaders will stand up and pay attention. Gwen, I want to stay with you because I believe this question is to you, although it doesn't have your name on it. Um, and I believe it dealt with the, uh, the slide we had up at the very beginning because it says, do you believe that those your statistics are the result of discrimination, quality of talent pool, or other? Well, first of all, they're, they're not my statistics necessarily. They're from other studies. Uh, I know we didn't cite them on that slide, but they are from other studies. Um, I, I think it's a little bit of everything, but I do believe it is, again, a lack of appreciation for the value of, of diverse talent. And, and, and the notion that uh, you know, black leadership matters in this country uh, and it can make a huge difference, especially when you think about the growth of business, it, when you think about employees that you, you really wanna tap into. I notice a lot of companies lately are going after historically black colleges and universities. They're gonna go do a lot more hiring there. Well, the truth is this generation of young black people coming out of, uh, of colleges are looking to see if they if their presence is affirmed at all levels of the organization. And if they can't see it, they can't be it. And so they may not enter your company despite the invitation. So I, I think this is about not valuing uh, the, you know, the skills and talent that a lot of black leaders uh, uh, bring to the table. And also not understanding that black leaders are also exhausted by all of this. Uh, especially today. I mean, the, the fact that they're under a lot of pressure to prove and reprove themselves over and over again. They face a lot of headwinds, a lot of microaggressions in the workplace, only to see themselves passed up and passed over, you know, once again. So I think leaders just need to sit, sit still and listen, uh, talk to some, uh, some members of this community to understand what their experiences are like and, and really determine whether or not you're committed over the long haul to seeing progress around racial equity in, in the business. Dane, Dane, sure, just, Dane, go. I would just throw one other thing on it, um, which you know I'll try in some ways to simplify it, and I think almost everything comes out of this. It wasn't a priority. Um, and you can come with all the reasons why it wasn't a priority, but it was not a priority. And because when it's a priority, it gets focus. When it gets priority, it gets accountability. When it's priority, it gets action. And exactly. somebody, somebody takes all that. It was not a priority. And I would say the last part of it not being a priority is most corporate leaders have absolutely no proximity to this community, zero. When I, uh, I've had a lot of friends over a period of time, you know, leaders of companies, board of directors, and they say, Dane, I got to do more. I want to do more. I feel, you know, some version of a, because we trust each other, a guilt exposure. I feel terrible. You and I haven't talked about this enough, all that version of it. What can I do? And I have pretty much a, a similar comment to all of them. I say, okay, as it relates to the African-American community, they're roughly 13% of the population. You wanna make a difference. I would love you to start devoting 13% of your energy to the community. That means if you go to church every week, every 13th week, <laughs> you know, or every 10th week, every 10 uh, weeks, you should go to a black church. If you're mentoring people, <laughs> Out of your 10 mentors, make sure one is black. Just commit to the community. But the, the, vast, the vast reality of it is, is they have no proximity to it. And therefore, it's not a priority. And also, therefore, when people talk about it, they have no connective tissue to understand what it's about. And when, and when you have that sort of cognitive dissonance, yeah. what's the natural human behavior? Avoidance. Sure. <laughs> That's it. Sure. I don't. Yeah. And, and Gwen, I know we, we've talked about it uh, in your career where uh, you were the chief diversity officer uh, and your CEO really didn't know what to do with you. And he attended another CEO only meeting where other CEOs of like 
size, if not larger companies were talking exclusively about what they were doing on diversity and inclusion for the last hour. And he came back to the office and said, oh, my God. Uh, right. Uh, he was he was he, he was embarrassed, publicly embarrassed by a room of peers. And I had been on board for almost two years uh, reporting into him at, at one point, And he was uncomfortable with this topic. Yeah, there was no amount of brilliant strategy, data, assessments I could bring to him that would make him care. Uh, and at, after he went to that session, it changed everything. And he came to me and said, wow, you know, it, it's sad, but everything you tried to tell me is what I learned today from someone else, from, you know, from competitors. And I imagine you are probably trying to leave the company. How long have you been here? <laughs> and I said, almost two years. And I was thinking to myself, yep, resume's on the street. <laughs> and, and, and he said, then what can I do to keep you to, you know, keep you here? And I promise, you know, if you stick with me, I'm going to change this and, and give me five things that if you were me, what five things would you go do tomorrow to change or alter the course of this company's commitment to, to diversity? And there began a much more fruitful and probably one of the best relationships I've had with the CEO. So here's a question for the panel. Um, and I'm, I'm going to read verbatim. As a board member, I'm responsible to the stockholders and owners. Their main concern is long-term growth and profitability. Any initiative to which corporate resources are going to be devoted must serve that concern. How can diversity be tied conventionally so that the board can focus on it? Most, I'm reading like I'm in fifth grade, sorry. Most suggestions that seem to be coming from the panel seem to be tied to the benefit of diversity being given rather than being shown to be congruent with the main objective of the organization. What convincing arguments do they, do you have to make that connection? Well, I think that the talent piece is nothing else. It is a very competitive talent uh, market out there, and it always will be. I, I don't think that, that that will change much. And understanding that you can ill afford to leave talent, you know, sort of dying on the vine is where this happens. Uh, and so, you know, if talent is your company's greatest asset, then the diversity of that talent has to be a, a, a key part of the strategy, Con considering, you know, there's a lot of great research that shows the more homogeneous teams are, the more they run into groupthink and the less innovative they are. There's tons of research out there to show that diverse teams may start out a little slow, but what they are capable of doing over time is outperforming uh, in terms of business growth and business success. So I would offer from a talent perspective, if nothing else, that's where I would I would see the ability, you know, how diversity drives greater business value. Yeah, I, I would also I'm say, glad, glad, Victor. sorry, Dane. Um, I would also say it's an economic argument. You know, where is the growth of your business going? Where is it coming from in the future? Maybe not today, but for certain in the future, you got to look at the data around the demographics of this country. And so, if that doesn't compel you, then I don't know what will, but if, if you, you have to rely on those areas of growth in the future and you gotta have insights on those consumers. Consumers, I don't care if you're a B2B company today because you're ultimately gonna be tied to those consumers. And um, so I, in my mind, it's an economic argument. It's an imperative. And, um, and your shareholders are gonna hold you to task for that if, if you don't think about that today. Dane, yeah. the last word on this. I'm going to say a couple of things, a couple of different pieces on that. I think, first of all, while that actually is a fair question, I think it's only a fair question in a certain order. And the order that that question can be asked is after you've already crossed the bridge of, I deeply understand the role that diversity plays in my organization. So I don't think you get to skip that step and say, hey, how do you give me an argument that ties back to the, the, the strategic um, uh, you know, direction of this company. By the way, that's once again trying to, you know, that puts someone in the position of I have to prove the piece. I think you have to understand it. Um, you have to understand if, you're, if your organization only has 3% black people and the population is 13, why is that? Do I understand it? Do I understand where we're recruiting from? How we promote, what we do? Do I actually understand the system 
And what I would um, what I would argue is that when you do that investigation, in my experience to date, everybody who's gone down that path has been negatively surprised about what they find. Um, and so there could be the one company out there that proves this wrong. But in my case, usually when people go through that uh, data hunt, that treasure hunt, that introspection, they're not happy with it. And they're not happy with it as it relates just to diversity. They're unhappy about what it says, says about their process, their processes and their value system. Right. Um, and so it hits both of those. And then the last thing I would say is that if your employees care about it, it doesn't matter whether it's aligned uh, to what you think your plan is. Ultimately, you're dependent on talent. And, and ultimately, because this is a focus of, of employees and it is a focus of the next generation, if you don't make it a priority, others will and you will lose. Can't tell you well, when you lose, but you will lose. Well, one of the things that we did with this panel, or what we did not do, is spend time making the business case extensively for diversity. And that is because it's been made time and time again. And in our research and talking to all of the largest investors in all of the largest PE firms and all of the largest hedge fund activist investors, they got it. And they have publicly committed and privately to me also that they see it as a business concern. Uh, I know we've talked about uh, risk assessments around diversity, around talent uh, that are deeply important. Um, so that's something that uh, in, in the conversation going forward, uh, we wanted to spend our 70 minutes talking about uh, uh, some of the other things in the business case, which for the last 10 years has been made. Um, and then what I will ask you guys to do uh, we'll start with Victor, we'll go to Dane, and we'll end with Gwen, closing arguments, which are, um, what does good look like? You know, what does good look like? Well, look, um, in this environment, it's harder to see what good looks like, but I, 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 it can't get any worse than we are today. I think good is when we, when, when we don't even talk about this. Good is when we don't talk about diversity and inclusion, when we talk about ourselves as citizens of this country and citizens of this world. Um, maybe it's a little bit naive, but man, that's that's where I'm striving. That's what good looks like. Dane? Yeah, uh, similar to that, I, I, yeah, it's great. I, I, I wait until, wait till we get to the point where diversity, equity, and inclusion is just our culture. <laughs> um, it's not something separate, it's ingrained. It's just what you do uh, uh, as an organization. And I think that's what good really looks like um, as a result. And then the other thing good looks like, and, and I believe that everybody who goes down the path of really self-analyzing themselves and really looking at the data, data, and I would have said this prior to the conversation we just had before, realizes that inclusion is entirely synonymous with high performance. It actually is the creation of meritocracy. It actually is the creation of the maximization of the potential of the people that work for you. And that the people, and we found this when we did our analysis at Goldman, the people that are the most inclusive leaders are the most commercially, uh, commercially effective. We found it, the data proved it. Um, and so I would just tell you that when you know the future looks like people are driving inclusion, not just from some ethical or moral value set, which I think applies, but because they're like, not doing this means you're not high performance. And that's, that's really, uh, to me, what good looks like. And Miss Gwen. I would say, in addition to, to, to what uh, my colleagues have said, good also looks like a level of intentionality, you know, where leaders just naturally see uh, the connection and the importance of this in an integral way, um, and that they're not knee-jerking in the 11th hour to look good publicly. Uh, that they're working on this consistent with any other key aspect of business strategy. And Good looks at this in a way where they can honestly talk about the shared accountability at the top of the house to make things happen in a positive way uh, and, and not sort of splitting hairs over uh, which group do we hire today? Uh, which movement is going to motivate us to take a stand today? Is it, is it the Me Too movement? Is it Black Lives Matter? Being able to see this as, you know, that the workplace is sort of a microcosm of what's happening more broadly, I think requires a growth mindset and a change of perspective for leaders. And that's what good looks like to me. Well, I, I appreciate that. And uh, 
you know, given how we live these days virtually through Zoom and other mechanisms, we know that uh, not spending too much time on Zoom is extremely important, which is why we couldn't get to many of the questions, uh, but we'll be happy. I personally will be happy to get to them offline uh, at, at a later date. That's absolutely not a problem. Uh, but it is now time for me to say thank you to the audience. Again, you had a choice and you chose to spend your time with us. And of course, to Gwen, Victor and Dane, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. I think you've all made your points about the importance of this subject and how it is tied to uh, the improvement of business and improvement of human capital management. Uh, at this time, I'd like to just simply take a point of personal privilege as the moderator and thank my colleagues. Kathleen, Kathleen, Carrie, Dave, Lauren, Lauren, Laura, Sharon, Melissa, Natalie. Uh, I hope I didn't miss anyone, uh, but I, I'm very fortunate, and this is what I could tell, tell everyone out there. I'm very fortunate to work in an environment where everyone is professional. It's an environment that I like coming to work when we used to go back to work to an office. Um, but most importantly, where all of my teammates have my back. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that makes it a great place to show up uh, every morning on video and, and, and relate to them. So yes. I appreciate my teammates uh, for helping me um, and having my back. I appreciate the audience and I appreciate my panelists today. Thank you so much and enjoy your day. Thank you.